I fought a war once. It's been a long time since I've seen combat, more than a decade actually, but even after all that time, the memories of Iraq, the sand, the heat, the people, the violence, those have stayed closer to my heart than almost any other thing I've done. In today's story, we follow a veteran who faces a similar problem, coming to terms with the guilt of surviving something that many others did not. He's a man who's taken up ultra-marathoning, super long-distance running, as a way to escape the memories and feelings that have haunted him since his last ugly day in the sandbox. But on this run, he finds something else chasing him through the rocky sand of the Mojave Desert, something he may not be able to outrun. Welcome, dear listener, to the West Side Fairy Tales. I am your host, reader, and author, Tyler Bell. And, before we get to today's tale... I'd like to tell you about a couple things I think you might be interested in. This month's book recommendation is The Lovecraft Complete Works by H.P. Lovecraft. It's actually quite stunning how many horror fans I come across who tell me they absolutely love the Cthulhu mythos and yet have never sat down to read through the complete Lovecraft. If you're unfamiliar, H.P. Lovecraft is considered the father of cosmic horror and I'd consider it mandatory reading for any serious horror fan, and especially for fans of my podcast. He was, after all, one of my and many other horror authors' greatest inspirations. There are really no Lovecraft novels, at least in the most important cosmic horror subsection of his career, but rather a series of short stories all dealing with the same cults and mysterious dark gods of the cosmos. In particular, The Rats in the Walls, The Shadow Over Innsmouth, and The Color Out of Space are wonderful, eerie little tales. And, if you get around to reading them, I'm sure you'll see where I've used Lovecraft's style to color my own work. It's an absolute must-read. My random horror and dark fiction recommendation of the week is a little independent video game called Hollow Knight. It's an adorable, gloomy, and very comfy game that embodies every aspect of what I consider gothic horror. Despite its fairly frenetic gameplay at times, at its heart, the game is about exploring the remnants of a dark underground kingdom, a place still inhabited by the living dead husks of its former residents and blanketed in the traces of the curse that brought the once mighty civilization to its knees. If you like old school 2D Metroidvania games, this is an absolute must play. It's a tad difficult at times, so I can't necessarily recommend it to the most casual of players but you should definitely check it out if that sort of thing is up your alley. It's a stunning take on an old genre using a new method of storytelling and a terribly beautiful and melancholy game. Check it out. Now, without further ado, today's story from Barstow back home. Jeb was on the outside of Barstow, deep in the desert, when the visions began to take hold. There were cameras back where he started, and Barstow itself, and people behind them chattering and changing focus and asking questions. One of them even ran behind him for a while, camera bouncing in time with his feet as he tried to keep up with Jeb Humphreys, the great gimp, as they take into calling him. But that man and all the rest had fallen behind as he got out there into the scrub and flat loneliness of Barstow Road, southbound 247. The only sounds for the longest time were the rush of the wind, and his own feet on the ground. The crush of gravel beneath the Ciccone running shoes he'd broken in with a marathon last week, shoes that would be all but ruined when he finally jogged into Pendleton. The other runners had fallen behind in a way, though a few had done their best to keep up with him for the first 26. People always did. The great gimp didn't seem like much of a challenge until you ran along with him, and then goddamn would he drop the brakes off and surprise you. But now, he was alone. Alone as he could be. A new sound had come up behind him as he ran, the rumbling of one of the semis heading down the highway to Lucerne. The vibrations in the ground cut deep and got worse, so that he felt his teeth chattering. His stride remained confident, firm, the steady pat-pat-pat of the ball of his foot pushing him forward, his right foot at least. The other one seemed to have stopped making noise. He glanced down and saw nothing but blood trailing along the ground, arterial spray that flecked the dusting of sand on the blacktop making little balls in the dirt. His heart wanted to leap, but he kept it tied down. His breath wanted to run ragged to go panicky, but he kept it in line. 
And Jeb kept running, kept moving. Always keep moving, he thought to himself. The rumbling grew and grew, getting more oppressive. The semi was bearing down on him, the black stink of burning diesel and superheated metal moving ahead of it like a pressure wave. It washed over him, almost made him lose balance. The mountains in the distance seemed closer and higher than ever before, white-capped and radiant in the sun. He wasn't in the Californian desert after all, he thought, wanting to reach out and touch the poppy plants growing like corn beside the road. But then they were gone, burned away to ash in a second. A sound in his ear, the familiar static of a radio. CSC, this is Echo 2 Bravo, it said. It sounded like it was coming straight out of the headphones he'd worn for the run. He pulled them free before the message could finish, and the rumblings got worse. The gravel ahead of him rocked and rolled, bouncing two feet off the ground in places. Then it passed. A cherry red semi truck no different than any he'd ever seen before in his life. It howled by in a fury of wind and smoke, a gust of displaced air nearly knocking him off balance. The truck fired off a horn twice in quick succession, and then was gone leaving only a puff of wavering black fog to mark its path. Though, for a second, Jeb could have sworn he saw flames guttering out every window. He dreams as he runs, and the feel of his shoes hitting the ground are all that keeps him tethered to this world. He is running, and he is sitting on a pile of sandbags beneath a tarp of tattered, sandy cloth that casts half-moons of light onto the surface of the hard-packed desert earth. Baker is sitting beside him, with a cigarette tucked into a hole punched into his Nomex face mask. The normally tan material, devised to protect their skin from flash heat and an explosion, is dark brown from the sweat of a hundred patrols and the grime of a dozen sandstorms. Even the menacing teeth Baker has drawn on with Sharpie have faded to dull gray. So if I had to fucking guess, Baker says, I'd say uh, Dirty Latina Mates is the best porn out there. Hands fucking down. That shit is off the fucking chain. Vince Gringo. Martinez adds with a laugh, coming up behind Baker and rifling through the unused grenade pouches on his flak jacket until he finds Baker's half-empty pack of Marlboro Reds. Baker slaps at his hand, but Martinez pulls one free anyways, lighting it with an MRE match. Me? I like the fucking, what's it called? Fucking monsters of cock. Yeah. With that big dick cubano. ¿Sabes qué estoy diciendo, Tirado? Tirado doesn't answer. Jeb looks over at him and sees only the man's back. Martinez waves a hand and blows smoke into the canopy over their heads. It lingers there, swimming out through the cuts in the cloth. He knows, Martinez says, waving a dismissive hand at Tirado. This guy, el monstruo de verga, he's got this, like, mole on the side of his dick he calls la perla. And son, he fucks these white girls so good. Baker throws his hands in the air. Oh, here we go again with the conquistador shit, he says with a laugh, and Martinez continues. They're like, oh shit, we can't. Este demasiado grande, papi, he says, pantomiming sex on Baker's shoulder and falling over him. Baker laughs and struggles to push Martinez off. But you can tell they're getting into it and shit, and he's just beating it up, turning that rosa a roja. Oh, papi, no mas, no mas, Baker says in a high-pitched voice, shifting sideways so Martinez falls onto the ground, pulling Baker with him. Baker starts bouncing on Martinez hard enough to make the smaller man lose his breath. Get off me, dickhead, Martinez laughs, and Jeb laughs too, pulling his legs back so his feet don't get crushed in the melee. Help me, Humphreys. Don't let this white boy keep us down. Martinez holds out a hand. Baker is still bouncing on him. (laughs) I'm not getting involved in this shit, Jeb says, nearly in tears. Though he's not laughing the way they are. Not quite. He turns to Tirado. Hey, Tirado, what's your favorite kind of porno, dude? But Tirado isn't there. There's nothing but a pile of bloody camis on the ground, along with two boots and half a Kevlar. The sound from the guys has all but stopped, and Jeb turns. Hey, Humphreys, what's wrong with your leg, man? Baker asks. But nobody is there. The sandbags are pitted from gunfire and burning in little orange circles that spread out from the pockmarks. The sky is dark. The canopy is on fire.
Jeb jolted back into reality 20 feet from the road, his pace guy's hand on his shoulder. The sand was packed flat here and much easier to run on than the roadside, but the scrub could hide any number of snakes to bite him or fissures to crack his ankle. He made a slight heading change and got back on the road in an instant, nodding away his pace guy's concern. This guy was blonde and in his early 20s, a volunteer marathoner excited for a chance to keep the great gimp on schedule to finish. Somebody else that had bought into the hype generated by one of the dozen videos they'd seen online. Somebody that didn't probably know how deep that rabbit hole really went and how goddamn awful it was to crawl out of it. You can slow down, the guy said, traces of late stage exhaustion in his voice. You're ahead of your pace. I've got to keep moving, Jeb said, his voice sounding odd, almost trapped between the rhythmic pulses of his breathing. The sun was a bloated tangerine, spilling juicy red and orange light over the buildings in the far distance. A breeze coming from that direction carried the peppery stench of gun smoke. Mr. Humphreys, the pace guy said. Jeb wished he'd learned the kid's name before setting off, not that he'd have remembered. He had trouble remembering things all the time now, except, of course, the shit he can never seem to fucking forget. I'm not telling you to stop, just that you're ahead of pace. Steady mechanical thumping filled the air above them, casting down air currents that sprayed the dust in every direction. Jeb closed his eyes against the grit pelting his face, but kept running at the same steady stride. He heard the pace guy falling slightly further behind him. Jeb could only dimly remember picking the guy up at the end of the second leg of the race, somewhere outside of Lucerne maybe. The thumping got louder and louder, until he could barely hear the guy running along behind him. He was saying something about a sandstorm suggesting they waited out, but Jeb shook his head. That's not a sandstorm, he yelled back. This asshole's just flying that fucking 46 way too low. The guy yelled something, but Jeb couldn't hear a thing. He ducked his head and picked up his pace, feeling tightness in his right leg but pushing on harder anyway, trying to get away from the underside of the chopper. God, I fucking hate those things. Baker says, watching the CH-46, the big double-rotor Seahawk helicopter, shuffling loose of gravity and floating up into the heavens above the camp. Red hydraulic fluid has stained the landing pad inside the walls of Observation Post Oliveira, an ugly brown block of concrete the locals had used as a hotel in that far-off time before everything was war and ugliness. The stains are blood-dark and scattered in constellations through the sand. Yeah, Jeb says. He has trouble standing, so he leans against the wall of the roof. They rarely came up here, only but one or two times when they were in country, and so it seems odd in this dream for him to be standing there. The roof is covered in thick steel plates. Cargo skids were purposed as armor against the insurgents' occasional mortar attacks. Beneath that is concrete and sand, and a hundred or so of the meanest motherfuckers to ever walk the face of the earth. United States Marines. In one of the most dangerous countries on earth, it is the safest place imaginable, blending in amongst the seemingly endless blur of brown and green that makes up this desert nation. Little songbirds ride the late summer thermals up the side of the building to rest on sandbags filled by men who'd already done their rotation in this war, and are now out and free, carousing at colleges or getting drunk or working the blue-collar jobs that were always awaiting men like him back home. The town which this building is a part of spreads out small and tight between the aqueducts sprawling out the Euphrates and the Euphrates itself. There are orchards of small trees and little black swatches of earth where the locals are turning up the fields for planting. People walk in the market beside the beleaguered police station, itself a mass of cracks and holes left by bombs and bullets. But in this moment, there's peace. There are the birds and the soft sound of the wind that always seems to be blowing here. The sun is setting in the west a beacon that might lead all of them back home one day, to that place across the ocean that seems more a dream than this dream itself, a place they find more and more unfamiliar every day, until even the happiest thought of home is tinged with pain. You in your head again, Humphreys? Baker says, back to Jeb, smoke curling up around the front of his Kevlar. You're supposed to ask something more along the lines of, why do you hate helicopters, Baker? Jeb laughs and apologizes. Why, Mr. Echo 2 Baker, do you not like helicopters? Jeb asks. Because, dearest Mr. Echo 3 Hotel, 
Baker says, turning with his cigarette held sideways in front of him. The CH-46 is like a woman who's never off her fucking period. She's testy, can never seem to get inside her, and she fucking bleeds all over you. Baker laughs, and Jeb laughs along with him. He can see Baker's uniform and flak jacket are stained with fluid from the 46's hydraulics, which, common grunt wisdom says, are supposed to leak on you, otherwise the thing will fall right out of the sky. And common grunt wisdom is worth gold in the land of bullets and bullshit. Baker takes another hit off his cigarette and blows a perfect circle into the blue. He passes the cigarette through it while making stupid helicopter noises with his mouth, then gives Jeb a serious look. But you know how 46 is most like a woman? He asks. Jeb crosses his arms and shakes his head. If that bitch stops bleeding on you, then you got a real fucking problem on your hands. He makes a sound that's half a baby's cry and half major rotor malfunction and crashes his cigarette into the wall. The impact makes a real explosion that rocks the building, and Jeb looks out to see a cloud of smoke rising in front of the base's entry control point, the ECP. You know why I really don't like him, though? Baker asks. His face is serious. There's more than hydraulic fluid on him now. It's that darker, redder sort of stuff. It's dried on his face and neck to a black crust, but more is blooming here and there through his uniform. He nods at something in the distance. They always seem like they're going, even when they're coming, he says softly, pointing into the distance where the 46 seems stuck to the sky, a black speck poised just at the edge of disappearing, right at the vanishing point. You are going really hard, buddy, the man said. Jeb had never seen him before, but then again, maybe he had. It was a white man, or rather, a man pale to the point of flat whiteness. His features were devoid of racial origin. In fact, they looked almost drawn on or cobbled together, like if an alien heard an interesting story about a human being and never having seen one, decided to sketch it into existence. Jeb could feel his shoes tapping out that same steady rhythm on the ground beneath him. Behind the mystery man, the scrub and sand had gone dark. Night had settled in deep over the California desert, but the stars were thick and bright in the sky. Bright enough that Jeb knew he was running fast. Very fast. But the man kept up right beside him, all without ever breaking stride. And the man was walking. He wore a dark coat despite the lingering August heat and a similarly dark suit, though his shoes and gloves were a garish red. The man was of a normal, indistinct build, slight without frailty, tall without towering, and yet something about the construction of this creature seemed madly incongruous with what Jeb knew about how people were made. The proportions were off, the legs too short, the torso too tall, and, Jeb realized as he ran alongside this odd creation, the man wasn't really walking at all. He was soaring just above the gravel as though all the world were some great treadmill Jeb was stuck running on while this man-thing moved along beside it. And still yet, there was something in the man's face he recognized, though he couldn't quite place it. What are you running from, anyway? The guy said. His face had a way of cracking left and right at the jaw when he talked. The lines of his face danced in and out of joint like a Picasso right one second and madly fucked up the next. Jeb thought that maybe he wasn't seeing the man at all, but some idea of him. That face looked as real as though it had been painted on the distant mountains in moonlight and animated by some trick of perspective. But the moon grew brighter as it rose over the desert, and Jeb saw real shadows shifting over the guy's features. Nothing, Jeb said, keeping his eyes on the road. Little twisted desert trees now dotted the roadside, his leg had the familiar ache that told him he was heading up, up into the barometric differentials of the mountains in the state park. Despite the radiant starlight, the terrain seemed strange and alien. Only the occasional glow stick tied to a mile marker told him he was on the right path. Lies, the guy said, laughing. Not that I blame you. Everybody that comes here is running from something. The man moved his hand in front of Jeb's eyes and wiped the face of the moon away tearing away the lunar flesh and leaving a smear of blood across the sky. It spread, covering everything in dull red until Jeb saw where he really was, running in place in a great red nightmare. The ravaged moon stared down at him, 
truly a face now, dead and milky-eyed. The guy's feet touched the ground here, left little flat marks like a cartoonist might draw to represent footprints. His broken face and way of speaking was all the more pronounced as well, and every movement of his jaw made a painful click that churned Jeb's guts. A thin carpet of black centipedes parted as the man took position to better study Jeb's face. Get out of my way, Jeb said. I don't have time for this. The guy laughed and stepped aside, covering Jeb in a cloud of smoke as he did so. Jeb waved his hand in front of his face, coughing, but never losing stride. Every breath felt like sandpaper in his lungs, and, for a brief second, the feeling that he was going to pass out and slide down the mountain rushed over him. Then it passed, and he blew free of the cloud of smoke to find himself cresting a real mountain beneath a dimly occluded California sky. The stars were gone. Something rumbled on the slender, curving mountain road that had led him to this high point. Fire danced over the dark hills and painted the sky in a blazing array of yellows and reds and oranges, so that heaven itself looked more on fire than the earth around him. He'd gotten lost somewhere in the mountains. It slipped off the road he was supposed to be on. The rumbling grew louder. You're determined not to stick around these parts, huh, kid? The guy said, though he was further back now, no longer quite able to stick to Jeb's pace. That's pretty impressive. Gotta say, those stories they tell about the great gump where I'm from... I'm really surprised they're all true. Jeb didn't say a thing to the guy. His teeth were chattering in his head, rocked by the tires on the pavement behind him. They're all betting against you, the guy said. Except me. I didn't put a cent on this race. Orange lights filled the road around Jeb, and the overpressure from the truck nearly pushed him off the edge of the road. He would have given that precipitous drop a second look if the thing he'd thought was a truck hadn't commanded his absolute attention. The shape of a big 16-wheeler was there, in theory. But aside from the glowing orange headlights, the monstrous vehicle was a writhing mass of bleeding flesh. Legs, dozens of hairy human legs of various sizes and colors, beat the ground underneath it to push it forward. Still more legs waved and wiggled from the sides of the thing, where its cargo trailer should be from its front windows. Jeb watched the appendages mulch themselves to nothing beneath the overbearing weight of the thing, only for new ones to slither down into their place. His stomach churned and he vomited over the cliff. But he didn't stop running. Baker and the other guys are still laughing when Jeb pulls himself back over the balcony railing outside their barracks room. It's a typical North Carolina night outside still sticky from the lingering summer humidity. The rest of the guys are shirtless, drunk, and slicked head to toe with dirt and sweat from the field. Ten days of war games have ended in a night of drinking that will become legend to the Marines that joined this unit years later, mostly because of the sanctions against grunts purchasing liquor over 150 proof. You cannot drink for shit, Torado says, pouring another round of shots in every glass except Jeb's. Let me show you how we do this in Puerto Rico. He and Martinez grabbed their glasses and cheered together. Arriba! Abajo! Al centro! Al dentro! The others follow along, gumming out the Spanish as best they can while following the moves Torado and Martinez make with their glasses. Then the liquor's gone. McIntosh, a heavy-built pale guy from the bleak wastes of Alabama, raises another drink. How about to the heroes that came before us, he slurs. Those brave souls fighting and dying over there right now. The guy's all boo in unison and he laughs even as he's being pelted by the filthy shirts they'd all worn in the field for the last week. Okay, okay. He lifts his glass to Martinez. To Martinez's wife, the sweetest lady any of us have ever known. May she one day imagine an excuse for why she keeps having half-white kids that Martinez won't have trouble believing. Cheers, they yell, except Martinez, who begins drunkenly cursing Macintosh in Spanish. They all take their drinks in the end. And fuck all that shit about heroes, Baker says, lighting a cigarette and joining Jeb on the balcony. Remember that shit at boot camp in the Crucible? Where they're sending you from station to station, and every challenge thingy is some guy with a medal of honor. Jeb nods and takes the cigarette from Baker, dragging on it long and blowing the smoke out into the night. 
At the time, you know, we all thought that shit was so cool, Baker says, shaking his head and taking the cigarette back. But then I think about it now, and I'm about to do this fucking second pump out there, and all I can remember about those guys is that most of them died getting those medals. Or they lost their legs and arms and shit, eyes. Who knows, fucking dicks too. They both laugh. And and I've been thinking, man, fuck being a hero. Baker says, that gung-ho shit is for boots and fucking pogues. Yeah, Jeb says. The liquor is hitting in full force. The night is warm and quiet. There is peace in this world, right now, that will never exist again. And like a million men before him, and a million men to follow, he closes his eyes and thinks of the desert. And he listens to a friend talk about an uncertain future. My dad's got an old Honda motorcycle, Baker says. Keeps it under a tarp in the garage since Mom told him he can't drive it anymore. Too dangerous. He flicks the dead cigarette off the balcony. When I get out, I'm going home to Barstow. I'm going to fix that fucker up and drive it straight down to Pendleton. Then I'm going to flip off the gates and do whatever the fuck I want for the rest of my life. Baker turns to Jeb and smiles. His teeth are broken. His eyes are missing. What about you? The fires burned clear through to early morning. For a long while, there was only the soft pink haze of the burning fires and the small patch of road that leads him forward. Despite how little he could see of it, Jeb never lost his way. He can dimly remember the worried faces at the way station for the third 26. Doctors running cold water over his face and insisting he think twice about continuing. He slept for a while, too. Maybe three minutes that felt like hours. The dreams are of a quiet, dark place between places. And there was another person there, a boy he didn't know, who never spoke a word to him. They sat in silence, and for the first time, Jeb felt like he could catch his breath. Then he leaned his head back, closed his eyes, and woke. The running had been hard after that last stop. His hips felt unbearably tight, though they relaxed as he recovered his stride. The concerned faces at the way station had told him he could slow down if he wanted, that maybe he should, but he couldn't slow down because if he did, then he would stop. And he couldn't stop moving, not ever. His pacer this time was a tall, dark-skinned woman with a grim face. She told him the same thing, that he was going too fast, faster than he could go and expect to finish. Now she phrased it was, You look like shit. You should slow down. But she kept up with him, unlike the last few guys. She had the build and pacing of a pro, though he couldn't remember who she was. But she kept up, and that was all that really mattered. So they talked. How's your leg? She asked. Fine, Jeb replied. How are yours? They're both good, she said. You're running really fast. He didn't say anything to that just kept pushing on despite how bad his leg was beginning to hurt. The other one, the bad one that had earned him the name the Great Gimp, had gone numb a long time ago. It was fine, though. That's just what happened to it. Lightning split the clouds overhead. You know you ran through a forest fire last night, right? She asked. He shrugged, watching clouds roll in overhead. How are you even breathing right now? More flashes, sudden and ferocious, brightened the early morning sky. A drop of rain hit the ground in front of him with a sound like a gunshot. I don't know, Jeb said. I just am, I guess. Then all the rain began to fall, and he threw his hands up as the crashing water fell over his ears like automatic rifle fire. He screamed. He is screaming. It's him making that noise, though he feels like he's just listening to a television in the next room over. Gunfire is a constant background static, noise covering the screen, obscuring the image. His hands are all the way red. Other red hands are touching him, grabbing him, pulling at his clothes and his rifle. He strikes at them, he strikes at the world. The pain has transcended thought. Baker, hold him down! Somebody screams. It's Macintosh, the corpsman. His face is tight and angry, and he's all covered in blood. It's smeared over him, over his face and flak jacket. Beyond his face is smoke and fire. Small flakes of ash fall down over Jeb, resting on his eyelashes and cheeks. 
He can't seem to wipe them away. Humphreys, buddy, Baker says. His face is there now, too. He's fine. Just fine. No blood at all. Hey, uh, you gotta, you gotta calm down, man. You're all fucked up, okay? But you're gonna be fine. We're gonna get you out of here. Baker's screaming all this, but it sounds so far away. There's a feeling like cold water rising around Jeb, as though it's coming right up out of the dirt and sand to bathe him, to cool him, to call him. He is fading down into it, which isn't so bad. It's not so bad down there at all. But Baker doesn't let him go. He's slapping Jeb in the face so hard his teeth are chattering. He can taste blood, and the pain floods back so suddenly he realized he didn't know it had gone at all. Baker laughs and nods. Somebody is being dragged past Jeb, and he knows without seeing the guy's face that it's Martinez, and he's not moving. The sand on the road turns dark as he's dragged over it, rolling up in muddy clumps like half-assed snowballs. You're going to be fine, okay, buddy? Baker says, and the look on his face suggests it's really important to him that Jeb agree. Jeb nods and Baker laughs, though it sounds worried, almost panicked. Baker digs through Jeb's flak jacket and pulls out a set of full magazines and holds them up. You come get these for me sometime, otherwise it's going to be hell for you at the armory. Just promise me you're not going to give up, okay? You keep moving, stay awake, keep on going. Never stop. Jeb watches his own hands raise up as Baker stands, moving back. The shadow beneath his helmet obscures his face. He reaches out for his friend, but Baker is moving away from him. His rifle is up at his shoulder and hanging over the hood of a burning Humvee. It's their burning Humvee, the vehicle his squad used to drive up to the post every day. It's on fire. The steel itself is being consumed by a noxious black cloud of choking heat. Then Jeb is being dragged back, back, back over the ground. His eyes can barely seem to stay open. The world is being swallowed by a big black circle that's steadily irising in, like the end of a Looney Tunes episode. All it needs is for Porky Pig to hop up and say, And that's all, folks. Like the big, fat, stuttering fuck he is. But what Jeb sees on his last day in Iraq, the last thing he'll see, in fact, until he wakes up in a little bed in Bethesda, Maryland, is his best friend standing there alone, silhouetted against all the heat and smoke and brown nothingness of combat. A shadow holding a rifle, giving that good covering fire, dropping bodies, holding the line. A Marine. A grunt. His best friend, breaking the promise he'd made to himself to not be a fucking hero. And then it's all dark. San Diego was hot, but not as hot as the mountains. Hot as that forest fire he'd jogged through. Hot as the desert itself. Jeb had been to San Diego before, though not until after he'd gotten out of the Marines. It was a sort of accidental stop he'd made on the odd journey his life had taken after the Marine Corps. The last time he'd been there was maybe six years before, when he was about 30 and drunk nearly every day of his life, slapping himself sober before taking this job or that to get by. He'd worked in offices, security jobs mostly, but also paper filing and other sorts of scut work they gave to people who could sober up long enough to tie a tie. He'd go in, do what needed getting done, and then take what he didn't need for rent down to the bar or corner store. Sometimes even a little more than that. He hadn't known at the time what had drawn him down to San Diego. He knew Martinez still lived south of there, though he probably wouldn't know Jeb from Kane anyway. The last he'd seen Martinez, the guy was three weeks into a four-month coma he'd eventually wake from like a bad dream. Jeb had seen him a couple times in rehab, but... Ultimately, Martinez had gotten his shit together somehow and disappeared back home. Guys had come to visit Jeb in the hospital, and he'd smiled and told them he was fine, even though he wasn't. The IED had taken his left leg off above the knee, and further amputation had left him with little more than a full hip. He tried to kill himself in the hospital by guzzling down a bottle of something he thought would do the trick after the first week of trying to walk on that mass of tattered flesh but he'd only made himself violently ill and pissed off the doctors. Guys and parts of guys and what was left of guys came in and out of the beds to his right and left. Families came in and hugged their wounded sons, their broken daughters, and without fail, all of them would eventually walk out that door. 
A few gave him awkward glances, saw the nasty scars crossing his face where shrapnel had left channels above and below his eyes, and he could tell they were thanking God their kids weren't as fucked up as he was. Eventually, they discharged him, and he roamed America, living off his disability check and not really going anywhere. Down was the destination, if you had to give one. He lived in alleys and tents and cheap apartments that took cash until he ended up in San Diego, drowning himself in the usual gutters. It was a Monday when he walked out onto the Coronado Bridge, clumping his way along on the badly maintained prosthetic they'd fitted to him years earlier. What family he'd been born into had all but gotten rid of him before he'd ever set foot on Paris Island. Everybody else was a casual acquaintance or gone. He sat up on the edge of the bridge and looked down at the water below. City lights shimmered on the water, rippling and dancing beneath him. The day he'd woken up in the hospital, they told him that Baker was dead. A bullet had hit him at the start of the ambush that had taken Jeb's leg. Jeb had unknowingly kicked off that assault by pulling aside the concertina wire gate at the entry control point and tripping the 60-year-old Russian mortar the insurgents had wired to it. The blast had shredded his left leg to ribbons and by some miracle thrown him four or so feet to land behind the Humvee. If that hadn't happened, he would have been swept up in the barrage of gunfire and rockets that pounded their small convoy just seconds later. Baker jumped out of the vehicle and laid down fire, trying to move closer to Jeb to open a path for the dock to get to him. Two little 7.62 rounds had punched through his flak jacket in the soft spot just beside the ceramic armor plate covering his chest. The damage to his internal organs would turn out to be terminal, but he'd shaken off the pain and stuck it out long enough to shut down the ambush. Reinforcements made their way out from the base, and he collapsed. Then he never got up again. Jeb looked down the alleyways and streets of San Diego as he ran, trying to take his mind off the pain of running, of going on. He probably looked like any other dude out for a run, though the sun shining off the steel clockworks of his left leg would get a second glance from anybody. Maybe people looking especially close might see the tears mixed in with the sweat running down his face. But he kept running. A cop had found him on the Coronado, stopped his car, and flipped on the lights to hop out with a casual, How you doing tonight, son? Jeb could barely remember what they talked about. In fact, the cop really didn't say much of anything, just sat there beside him and listened. And that conversation was all the words that he found written on that metaphorical stone floor, rock bottom, where all the ugly things take you if you let them. The rest was what led him here. Treatment at the VA, working on shit, getting to the bottom of rock bottom, so to say. So he kicked the booze and used his GI Bill to become a welder. He started moving, kept moving, like his friend had ordered him to all those years ago. The next step was fixing the body he had left and doing all the bad he'd done to himself. He fell into running with a crew of other wounded veterans in Eugene, Oregon, where he'd eventually moved. He was more surprised than most when he got up on the prosthetic running leg and started working his way up and up and up until he was running marathons. In a couple years, he'd set a record sprinting over the flattened black remnants of old Portland. Then it was like everyone knew him. They called him the Great Gimp, and he thought that was funny, so he stuck with it. And he kept moving. There are something like 150 miles between Barstow and Camp Pendleton, and it's only the last five that really start getting to him. Jeb is tapped out, burned up, and every step feels like broken glass. A thin black circle has formed at the edges of his vision and is growing smaller every second, irising down on him like the end of a Looney Tunes episode, he thinks. His pace slows for the first time since he started running. Maybe it's been slowing all along. He wants to stop, but then he hears something beside him, somebody else running, a shadow just out of his cone of vision, just behind him. Then there are other footsteps, a dozen at first, then hundreds. That same thundering, rattling feeling he's felt before is there with him, but there is no threat this time. Someone slaps him on the back and he straightens and picks up the pace, running harder, faster. They are all with him, shadows that linger just beyond where he can see. Their cadence is steady and uniform, and they are with him. His chest is near bursting when he sees the gates. Camp Pendleton, home of the 1st MEF, Marine Expeditionary Force. There is one lane cordoned off with orange cones for him and cameras and a crowd of cheering people. 
and people break off from the crowd to join the dark runners. Real men and women of every different creed and color. The only common denominator amongst them being the time they spent as U.S. Marines. And they yell his name, and he raises his hands, and collapses just past the finish line. There's some alarm, but he's back on his feet in seconds, supported by a couple of his buddies that have been waiting for him here at the finish. There's McIntosh, who's a fat father of four now, and Martinez, who looks like he'd never been shot at all. He's wearing a t-shirt with Torado's name and Baker's name, and the names of a dozen other guys who died that hot, ugly year in Iraq. But beyond that sea of faces, as the dopamine high of not running anymore makes him feel almost like swooning, Jeb sees a man on a motorcycle in the line of cars moving closer to the gate. He's a young guy, maybe 22 or so, wearing a brown jacket with a familiar unit patch on the shoulder and a tan motorcycle helmet with a black visor. The visor turns to Jeb and nods at him, a jerk of the head straight up in the air, which Jeb returns. Then the guy turns to the gate and flips his middle fingers in the air. One of the gate guards points at the guy and starts moving toward him but he just revs the shit out of that old Honda, hops the median, and takes off like a bat out of hell. Going. Going. Gone. Well, that was from Barstow Back Home. What did you think of it? Does anything from your past haunt you so badly you just can't seem to shake it? Have you ever nearly been run over by a flesh truck made of human legs? Let me know what you thought of this and any other story by reaching out to us on social media. You can get at me best at the at WS Fairy Tales handle on Twitter or by searching Westside Fairy Tales on Facebook and Instagram. Follow us and leave a message. If you want to contact me directly, and I always love hearing from fans, Go ahead and send a message to westsidefairytales at gmail.com. If you want to support the podcast, the best way is always, always, always to just share us with your friends and to give us a nice review wherever you listen to podcasts. Rating and reviewing us helps us rise up the charts and get new listeners. If you want to do even more, head on over to our Patreon where just $1 gets you access to secret content and updates and $5 or more gets you access to special behind-the-story videos, merch, and all kinds of cool stuff. Head on over to patreon.com slash westsidefairytales today. We'll be back in a month with the first part of a two-part tale I've titled simply Ghost Story. Without giving too much away, it's about a man living alone in a small garret apartment in Paris, and also a ghost. It's a slow, beautiful tale that I'm very proud of and I believe you'll love. So tune in for Ghost Story next month and till then, stay safe out there. Westside Fairy Tales is written, read, scored, and produced by Tyler Bell. All content herein is copyright 2018, Tyler Bell. Mm-hmm.